where Bach actually supplied his ornamentation for the repeats. So, like the, the G minor English beat, this is great music to study and to have your students study because we actually can see and hear how Bach ornamented his own music and it's extremely lush and sensuous and you might know that the Sarbonne was actually banned by the Pope at one time because it was considered too lascivious. Uh, so uh, the other movement are the Borets. This is from France. They're extremely sprightly, extremely energetic, and they have a, 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 even a rustic or an earthly character, even evoking the bagpipes in the second Boré with these, these drones and this kind of hefty nature. Uh, so again, Take out your passports and enjoy the, these four movements from boxing on your English suite.
Chopin's Opus 28, uh, his Preludes. Uh, so there is this tradition uh, that's very popular with romantic music in general, and that's uh, the addition of programming. Um, I, I don't know how Chopin would feel so, so strongly about the nicknames that are often given to these preludes, like the raindrops prelude or the suffocation prelude. Uh, Chopin really avoided programmatic music. In general, there, there is an instance of his G minor nocturne, opus 15, number 3. Uh, and it's just titled Nocturne in G minor. But on the manuscript, he actually wrote in quotation marks, at the graveyard. But then, after writing that, he furiously erased it, and he is known to be saying, let them figure that out for themselves. <laughs> so, nevertheless, these nicknames are very popular, so I thought I would take a stab at my own nicknames for these preludes. Uh, the, the more popular ones are from Hans von Duloff, who nicknamed them Raindrops, Suffocation, etc. Uh, but maybe in a hundred years my nicknames will be popular too, who knows. So, uh, number 16, I have nicknamed Headless Horseman. Uh, for a few reasons, the right hand reminds me of the wind blowing through the trees, curiously. And the left hand has that galloping horse rhythm. And I also call it headless because when the left hand starts to have octaves, I feel like I have no head because I can't even look at either hand. Uh, so, uh, 17 A flat major, I'm nicknamed Masquerade. Uh, to me, it reminds me of this, this highly romantic couple dancing like a waltz. And choreography is very important for this piece. And composers like Chopin and even Brahms really love to have the hands on top of each other at moments. And this piece could easily have been written where my hands are comfortably spaced apart. But they love, I think, kind of the symbolism of kind of a couple and kind of the, the sensuousness of the couple with the hands on top of each other. So they're, they're dancing this beautiful waltz, and it's a masquerade because Chopin will take you through the, the weirdest of harmonies in this piece. Uh, and at the very end, the last page, Chopin will give that kind of bell. The clock striking. So I like to think of Cinderella, but instead of the clock striking 12, it's going to strike 7. So maybe Cinderella is hungry and she has to go home for dinner. Or maybe Cinderella is partying all night and it's 7 a.m. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I think it goes either way. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, 17 is such a gorgeous piece. It was Robert Schumann's favorite, it was Felix Mendelssohn's favorite. It's my favorite, so I like to think I have good taste. Uh, but just a beautiful piece. Number 18 in F minor is Tragic. Uh, Bulaf nicknamed this one Suicide. And uh, it, it's extremely dark. Uh, I like to think of this as like a graveyard wind. Similar to 16, it's going to have this very kind of elusive right hand. But then it's going to have kind of the grim reaper and this kind of very solemn and stoic nature about it too. And lastly, number 19, another showpiece I've nicknamed Soaring. Kind of the feeling of being in a hot air balloon or just uh, no harm and no pain in one's way. So I hope you enjoy the, these four preludes of Chopin.
The next two pieces will actually be performed as a pair. Uh, so the first is the keyboard sonata in C minor, K11, of Domenico Scarlatti. Uh, he wrote 555 of them, so you might know this one, you might not. <laughs> but uh, you'll hear it regardless. Uh, this is uh, a real gem, I think, of all of them. Uh, it, it kind of contrasts these, this feeling of wandering from the opening and then a very kind of militant march. I like to think of toy soldiers uh, kind of marching through uh, this Scarlatti. And it's going to blend seamlessly into a contemporary piece uh, written by Sebastian Courier uh, called Scarlatti Cadences. Uh, this was actually a piece that was commissioned uh, for the 2005 Van Cliver. Uh, and Alexander Cobrin, uh, Eastman Zone was the, uh, the, the victor of that competition. But uh, this piece is fascinating. I love contemporary music that reacts with traditions of the past. So it's called Scarlatti Cadences because Sebastian Fourier is going to take these, these stock cadences. They sound like it could be in any Scarlatti sonata. They're extremely kind of generic. And uh, he's going to, of course, make them weirder. Uh, and these are going to really function as orbs, and they're going to be embellished by this, this beautiful filigree. It's extremely sensuous and lush, and the opening and closing sections are just extremely dreamy, celestial, ethereal. And this contrasts with the middle section, which is much more rustic and earthy. Uh, like the last woman of the Bach English Suite, this is also an Italian giga. Uh, a dance that Scarlatti also loved to write many of, so it's extremely vigorous and fast. And there's humor throughout, uh, but sometimes it's kind of ill-natured humor. You might think of your, your high school bully, or your middle school bully, or maybe you were the bully, but there was a lot of kind of taunting and kind of sneering at each other. Uh, so I would like to dedicate this to, to Jake, who punched me in the face and dodgeball in sixth grade. Uh, but uh, I hope you enjoy these, uh, the, the Scarlatti Sonata paired with uh, Sebastian Curry's Scarlatti Cadences. <laughs> Thank you. 
sonata, which is interesting because Beethoven is often pictured as this, this very cranky man who suffered greatly. I mean, we often think of like his Fifth Symphony is very representative of him. But this sonata is, is much more, um, I think, good-natured. Uh, the, the opening marking uh, translates as with friendliness or with amiability. And what I find fascinating in the sonata and his late sonatas is really that the prevalence of the string quartet. Uh, Beethoven would dedicate his last years to the string quartet, really, and this is kind of symbolic of coming full circle. Uh, the last three piano sonatas, of this 109, 110, and 111, all have the string quartet in a kind of a four-voice texture that really permeates throughout. And his first three sonatas, opus two, number one, two, and three, were dedicated to Franz Joseph Haydn, the father of the string quartet. And those sonatas also, highly evocative of the string quartet. And what I find inspiring about this is this music kind of represents a community, a, a utopia. In Beethoven's mind, music was to be shared between members. So as I'm playing this, I, I'm trying not to feel like just a solo pianist, and I'm not trying to feel like the romantic hero who's going against kind of the grain of the culture. But I'm trying to think of a community, kind of a shared sense of music making, kind of a common sense of humanity, I think. And uh, this is just one of the most special pieces on the planet, a perfect way to spend the morning. I think, so I hope you enjoy the, the first moment of this uh, Beethoven sonata. <laughs> Thank you. 
the, the last piece on the program, the big finale, is the, the prelude and fugue in D-flat major of Dmitry Shostakovich. Uh, so I failed to mention that the Beethoven Sonata was actually completed on Christmas Day, uh, December 25th, and uh, the Shostakovich prelude and fugue was written around Christmas time too, and it opens with a, a popular Christmas carol. <laughs> <laughs> we wish you a Merry Christmas. Uh, so, uh, humor really runs throughout this, this Shostakovich piece. Like the Courier, sometimes this humor can be a little crass at times, but nevertheless, uh, it's really pervasive throughout. So this opening prelude, I like to think of a circus. Uh, there's going to be a lot of characters come, coming in and out. There's going to be a military band coming in at once. There's going to be a, a little ballerina dance in the middle. Uh, but a lot of contrasting characters, and you get the sense that Shostakovich was really thinking orchestrally whenever he wrote for the piano. And the fugue, the, the piece de resistance, uh, is also filled with humor. It's always verging on atonality. It's going to include 11 out of the 12 chromatic notes, and it's kind of a devil's waltz. It's incredibly fast. But the, the rhythmic nature and the accents are all kind of jaunty and all over the place. And it's rather Beethovenian as well. So this piece is really pushing kind of against harmony throughout and against tonality. But as the piece wraps up, he's going to include these very Beethovenians. 5-1, five 5-1, one, five one, this dominant tonic as if shaking one's fist. Uh, so, if you don't like the feud, it'll be over in a minute, okay? <laughs> so, again, thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank uh, Miss Snowball again for opening her beautiful home and beautiful piano to us. And thank you again to Ryan Preston and Eliaric Suarez for all you've done. So. And thank you all for coming, of course. I hope this was a nice way to spend your, your Friday morning.
Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, on, as the president of the Guild, I'm really delighted to thank you again so much for performing for us this morning. You have such a distinctive artistic vision, and it's whimsical and it's imaginative, and I felt as if we were both being brought into the past, mm -hmm. and the past was being brought to us simultaneously. So it's a, a real gift you have, and I'm just delighted that you shared us, it with our, our whole guild this morning. Yes. Um, because we are live streaming as well. Oh, <laughs> true. <Yeah. laughs> um, and then once again, thank you to Barbara for hosting us, not just this year, but every year. She puts us all together. And it's such an auspicious start to our, um, our year. So I hope you all join us for a reception. Thank you. Yes, would you mind if we do a picture yes, with us?